Oh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Further Devolution Committee, uh, one, another one of our proceedings. Um, welcome to our witnesses this morning. Also, welcome to the people who are joining us as observers at the back of the, the hall. Um, I'm very grateful for you all being here. The first thing we've got to do is make a decision about taking items in private uh, and I seek agreement from members that agenda item four be taken in private. I'm very grateful. Agenda item two takes us to the evidence taking session on the estate, the Crown Estate provisions. And obviously I very much warmly welcome the first panel witnesses on the draft clauses on the Crown Estate to the committee this morning. Um, I'll rattle through very quickly who everyone is. Andy Whiteman, um, independent writer, researcher on land rights. Uh, Walter Spears from McCairn Mussels, formerly director of Scottish Agriculture Innovation Centre. Dan Finch, the chief executive of Moray Offshore Renewables. Angus Campbell, um, who is the leader of Coral Nine uh, Island Shear. Uh, Steve Barron, the chief executive of Highland Council. Thank you very much for coming along this morning to, to help us with our deliberations on the Crown Estate. Um, maybe I, I could open with a very general question to begin with, gentlemen, if you don't mind. The Smith Commission recommended that responsibility for the management of the Crown Estate's economic assets in Scotland and the revenue generated from these assets will be transferred to the Scottish Parliament. Do you consider that the draft clauses achieve that aim? And furthermore, how do you see your relationship developing with the Crown Estate in future in the new environment obviously we'll be getting into. So I don't know who'd like to kick off on that rather wide ranging question, but please feel free. Andy. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I mean, I welcome the Smith Commission recommendations, uh, but I do not think as <coughs> currently drafted, the, uh, the command paper does in fact implement the intent of the Smith Commission, or at least it has the the potential, given the way it appears to be very complex, it has the potential of, of frustrating the fairly simple uh, task, in my view, of, uh, of, of devolving the administration and management of these rights, which should be a fairly straightforward legislative matter, but in the way that it's been drafted, this complex scheme um, could, could, uh, could end up in a quagmire. Uh, could you just underneath that a bit more, Andy, so you could put some meat Well, the, the, the simple point is crown, crown property rights are already devolved. They were devolved in, 90, in, in the 98 Act. Um, and a number of crown rights are already managed in Scotland by the Crown Office. Um, so what we're talking about is a bundle of property rights that are currently administered and have been administered by the Crown Estate Commissioners and the predecessors um, down south since 1832. And we're talking about returning to Scotland the power to administer those rights. Um, and that, in my view, as I put out in, I, in my, my, my written paper, it, it should be a relatively straightforward matter of repealing a couple of sections in the Scotland Act, um, which effectively reserve the management of the Crown Estate, um, repealing the relevant section in the 2012 Calman Commission, the 2012 Scotland Act, um, repealing a bit of the Crown Estate Act and amending the Crown Estate 1961 Act to the effect that it doesn't apply in Scotland. And that is the kind of main legislative proposals. Beyond that, obviously, one does need some kind of uh, memorandum of understanding or whatever to make sure that the ongoing liabilities and contractual obligations that the Crown Estate Commissioners have entered into in Scotland are smoothly and capably carried forward once it's devolved. Opening. Thank you very much. Dan, do you want to... Just briefly introduce myself, really, and just to explain to the committee, um, I'm, I'm uh, the CEO of a company called EDPR. Uh, we are one of the offshore wind developers, and I would say that I will try and speak sort of generally rather than just for my own company. But we are um, one of the largest uh, wind developers in the world, We're the third largest wind developer in the world, and we chose to come to the UK to develop offshore wind because of the scale of the market and because of the way the whole process was governed and managed within the UK and UK infrastructure. So a couple of the benefits we saw immediately was there was a fairly straightforward system of land ownership or land control, if you like, or seabed control, which, believe me, is very, very complex in some of the regions in which we operate. Um, so we broadly welcome you know, the role of the, of the Crown Estate in actually developing and setting up a process that enabled us and many other major, major companies to invest in the UK and Scotland in particular. And secondly, we chose to move and set up our base in Scotland because of the support of the Scottish Government in particular for renewable power. 
and we still think that's uh, a key factor in why we are here and why we will set up our entire world and European, European and world operations based here in Edinburgh. One of the problems that we have is, although we broadly ag agree with the provisions uh, of this, uh, this uh, proposal, um, there, is also, uh, there are also powers that are retained within the UK government which actually do not facilitate the development of wind in Scotland in particular because they are not devolved. Um, whether these are devolved or not is entirely up to yourselves and the UK government, but what we need is you know, access to the market as a whole around the UK. The energy market is still a fully integrated market. We welcome the assistance that the Crown Estate has given us so far in developing offshore wind and attempting to meet UK government policy. But we would propose to yourselves that uh, the Scottish Government you know, takes control of that as much as it can within Scottish waters so that you have the whole package. You, know, you are able to manage not only the, uh, the role of the, the land ownership and uh, the appropriate contracts with major developers, including ourselves, but also that we are then able to deliver energy in the future, which at the moment is not the case. Thank you. And Walter? I've been a, a tenant of the Crown Estate for 30 years as a, as a shellfish farmer, and um, I think, maybe speaking on behalf of the aquaculture industry, the last thing we need is another period of uncertainty about who our landlord and stroke regulator is. The last time we had a, a shift was when the planning, um, the planning controls were taken from the Crown Estate and handed over to local authorities in 1999, which took 10 years to, um, to, to be settled, and that was a period in which the aquaculture industry stagnated. The problems caused by that 10-year period of indecision still rumble on with the ongoing audit and review process about leases that were granted at that time. So um, I agree that what has been proposed perhaps by the Smith Commission is correct in one sense, but is hugely complex. And I think for me there's a very simple solution if, it's, uh, if there's, there is a management job to be done of these states, and that at the moment is done very well by the Crown Estate, in, in my opinion. Um, the revenues seem to be... Um, the thing that's, that's in question, and I don't see any reason why those revenues can't be channelled to wherever yourself decide to put them through the existing management structure, which would mean that existing tenants wouldn't have a period of uncertainty and probability of different regimes happening in, in different areas of Scotland. The other thing, just referring back to 1999, when the reason that, that planning controls were sought by the local authorities to be taken from the Crown Estate is it was deemed to be a conflict that the Crown Estate were both regulator and landlord. If the powers are given over to the local authorities again, they will be in the same position that the Crown Estate were in in 1999, which they very much spoke against. So I feel that the, existed, the, the best way forward would be, the, would be the simplest way, and that would be to leave the existing management managing the estates with revenue being given to local authorities or whoever the Scottish Government decide to, to channel them towards. I guess I'm sure you have a view on that. I do have a view on that. Uh, I'll maybe start off by saying the Our Answer Future campaign was all about getting um, control of the seabed and, and the revenues devolved down to the islands. Uh, we very much welcomed the commitment by both governments to see that, that happen. We also very much welcome what the Smith Commission explicitly said the only three local authorities that were mentioned in it were uh, Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles. And we're very keen to see that, that that sentiment is taken through in the legislation that comes through. We're not seeing at the moment, I don't think, the clarity that um, that's going to happen. Can I say that um, one of the main issues we, we are looking at is to get um, absolute clarity on what happens with economic activity in, in the islands. And although I hear what my, my friend here is saying, I cannot agree with him. I think what you would do is get a position where um, the whole system is much more open and much more clear. And the example I will give is at the moment we have had a 40 megawatt um, development off the west coast of Lewis leased out by the Crown Estate without any involvement of people living in these islands or the local authority. Um, we need more clarity. I also think it will give um, much more to the fore the need of economic development for the people who live in these islands because the priorities will be serving that, that cause, not serving an individual organisation. Um, 
Can I point out that we have experience, particularly in Orkney and Shetland, of dealing with things up to 12 miles for the last 30 years? And I would suggest that the experience, if you look at that track record there, I think it's been done very well. Equally within local authorities, I do believe with the ability to, to do that. We deal with many other planning issues, very large planning issues, and we do it in a way that is transparent and open. We have the experience. I believe we can do it. It's a simple process. That's not complicated. Okay. Steve? I believe the Council's position is well aligned with, with that of the island authorities. Um, the Council wishes to see Crown Estate revenues directed to local coastal communities and the management of the Crown Estate transferred from the Commissioners to the Scottish Parliament and to local communities as appropriate. The Council's had a consistent position on this since 2007 when it um, convened a working group involving partners, including the island authorities, and produced a report um, in, entitled, um, the, sorry, noting the opportunities of devolution of the Crown Estate. Um, the Crown Estate in Scotland, new opportunities for public benefits. Um, the Smith Commission uh, report mentions the island specifically. It doesn't mention Highland Council, and that's of concern to us given the lead role that we've played in establishing and leading the working group and the high relative value um, of the Highlands in terms of the Crown Estate income. Um, and we are concerned that uh, Highland Murray and Argyll and Butte are omitted from, uh, from mention within, within the report. Um, all of the interested local authorities with Crown Estate assets within their area should be provided the opportunity to manage them. The Highland Council believes that that's well aligned with with other um, uh, direction, other uh, policy directions, directions at present, in particular the Commission for Strengthening Local Democracy and the Community Empowerment Bill. It's really important to support fragile communities and to drive social cohesion by giving them both the powers and the responsibilities that derive from, from Crown Estate revenues. Well, thank you. You all laid out your pitch pretty well as a beginner. Uh, I think we'll try to get into some of the nitty-gritty. Now, this is a quite a big panel, so we've got to be, try to be as succinct as we can, both in the questions we ask and the answers we get. Davish, is it OK if we start with you? Uh, thanks very much, Kavita. I wonder, Mr Barron, since you uh, were the last on, if you could just clarify um, Highland Council's ability to take on these responsibilities, because as we've heard from one of the panellists, um, there's some doubt as to whether there's a conflict of interest or that kind of thing. M Mr Campbell, answer that question. Would you like to give your Council's perspective on, on the very issue that Mr Spears raised in his opening evidence? I think the Council is well able to take on these responsibilities, and it has that at these um, areas of expertise in-house. We're already working with harbours, we're de dealing with marine planning, we're dealing with aqu aquaculture issues perfectly professionally, and um, taking on these powers and responsibilities would be an enhancement of what we do rather than um, an addition to what we do. You don't see, any, uh, you don't see the issues being raised as, as uh, a showstopper? No, indeed, I believe that the connection to local communities and the, the local de democratic link, which would be evident within, within th those actions, would, would make things stronger. The one I wanted to ask you about, it, the, the Smith Agreement actually says in respect of Highland Council or indeed any other um, local authority area with marine, um, marine areas, um, uh, and I quote, or other areas who seek such responsibilities, obviously by definition Highland Council would, would seek that. Are you aware of Argyll and Butte wishing, wishing again to have the devolution of these, both the management and the revenues to the, their areas as well? I can't speak for other councils. Informal discussions would lead me to believe that they are in a similar position with similar views, but I can't speak for Argyll and Butte. In, indeed, that's very fair. Um, I wonder if I could just ask Mr Campbell, I mean, uh, you made the, the pitch I would expect you to um, uh, for this, one I'm pretty familiar with, um, but I want to just be very clear, it is management and revenue, isn't it? We're not just talking revenue here, it's management and revenue. It is Mr. management Campbell. and revenue, and yeah. I think the, the recycling of that revenue back into the island communities can be a step change in the economies for the future. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just go one more, if that's all right, Mr. Crawford? Um, uh, uh, Mr. Spears, I mean, you make a, a recent argument. I understand that I was around in 1999. I well remember all the arguments about uh, uh, the aquaculture industry. But you'd, you'd, I, I presume you'd accept that, particularly in Auckland Shetland, we have marine spatial planning. We've been doing it for a long, long time. These issues uh, can be resolved. I, I appreciate you maybe, given where your business is based, you may be talking about another part of Scotland. But uh, these issues, uh, I would hope you'd accept, could be resolved. Uh, there's an onus on us to resolve them, but uh, they're not insurmountable. Would you accept that? Well, I think that putting the revenues to one side, it's about ownership. Uh, there's, there's no argument with the revenues. 
if the, the councils, uh, to my recollection, both fought hard for using the argument that the Crown Estate should not be both regulator and beneficiary. If the ownership, if you want to call it that, is given to the councils, then they will be in exactly the position that they fought so much against back in 1999. Yeah. So that's, that's history. That's but the point. revenue side is, is correct. Just one point about the revenue. I think one thing that's very important about the current Coastal Communities Fund is that it's deemed to be private money, which is extremely valuable to local projects because it's not public money and doesn't come into then state aid. Um, I'm not sure how that flow of money to coastal communities would continue, given it would be managed perhaps differently. Yes. Fair point. Yeah. Thank you. Th Tavish, thank you for asking the question so succinctly, and thank you for asking so succinctly back. So let's see if we can keep that going. Rob. So uh, welcome, uh, uh, panel. Uh, convener, there are five points here. There's the regulating of uh, what the Crown Estate's in charge of. There's licensing, there's planning, there's revenue raising, and there's revenue spending. Now, what I've heard from the Council so far is that they want the planning, the revenue raising, the revenue spending. But uh, we have at the present time the skills in the Crown Estate Commission itself in laying out many of the projects that uh, are beginning to show some revenue. Uh, how do you see the use of those skills being deployed? Would it be centrally, uh, say in Marine Scotland and uh, uh, in the government? Or would some of these powers, some of these people, come to local authorities? Angus, you want to kick, kick at that question? Yeah. I think we see very clearly that the, um, the work done by the Crown Estate on the ground can very easily be taken into local authority. We have the ability of, of doing these things already. I think it would be an exp expansion of that. There's a strategic element of this that I think should, um, we should remember that whenever we deal with, for instance, planning issues, we deal with it in the, content, the context of a national framework. And I think there's still a strategic position for the national framework to be set by Scottish Government we are well used to feeding into that system by taking that on board and working that through. And one example I'll give is the 50 megawatt split for, for renewables, for instance, where you get a level of decision making or setting the tone by Scottish Government and then we work into that. But it does give us the opportunity to feed in local priorities, to feed in the economic benefits for our area. Um, and if I can just take the, the example of it might not always be the local authority that's benefiting directly from all these things. There are other levels of taking it closer to communities. We have examples of that already, and that's how we envisage it would happen. Anyone else have a point on that? Dan Finch? Wiener, uh, members. Um, I, think, I think one of the areas of concern that we would have is that um, the current estates has a, a degree of commercial awareness and the ability to support some extremely large projects uh, to make commercial decisions and to have some flexibility. I can give you an example of this. Um, one of the major projects that we were involved in on the East Coast uh, of Angus, um, the company I worked for at the time, a small Scottish developer, uh, got into some difficulty with regard to our major uh, European partner. And the current estate was able to work as a partner along with that developer development in order to support it until there was a new buyer came into that process. So they actually supported us with, with funds and with, with actual practical support from staff. Uh, this enabled the project to survive and then to continue and that project's gone on to be consented. So there's the, there's the commercial nounce and the commercial ability to do that. We completely understand the uh, wishes and requirements of the local communities uh, and through their councils but we have to be really uh, aware of the fact that we are competing on a national, if not international, basis with other projects. So the involvement of Scottish Government in particular is absolutely crucial in, in the decision of these, uh, of the, the, this, these size of infrastructure. I mean, the, the projects we're talking about, in, in my case, or in the case of my fellow developers, require investments in billions of euros. So if we have other layers or other uh, hurdles to, to clear in order to get through uh, and to develop these projects, it makes it more and more unlikely that we would actually be able to do so. One of, the, one, of the, one of the benefits of us being in Scotland is the fact that the consenting process is controlled within Scotland. 
Uh, we've uh, recognised this. We've uh, worked alongside Marine Scotland and the Scottish Government to actually develop the projects. It's not been very easy, I can tell you that. Um, but one of, the, one of the downsides, if you like, is the fact that energy policy and energy and control of contracts, CFDs as they're known, still remains within the UK Government. To have another layer or another, uh, another authority, if you like, that we would uh, be answerable to and then and potentially have uh, conflicts with, uh, with, when we're, with other competing projects in the UK and in Europe would just make it far, much more complicated for us. Could I just follow that one up? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I understand that only a quarter of the consented offshore wind uh, has got a contract for difference support and that uh, possibly uh, if the Crown Estate is devolved uh, unless there is some uh, relationship between the energy policy which provides uh, the uh, certainty for the development of these, that uh, it could be that the local communities can miss out hugely on the revenues that could flow from that, so that uh, indeed, the, with the cost of transmission charges being higher, it might well be that this uh, contracts for difference are not granted by the UK government to uh, energy policy in our area. That's absolutely the case, uh, Mr. Gibson. Yeah, we, we are uh, in, a, in a process where we have to spend tens of millions to get through a consenting regime uh, with no certainty whatsoever, or even having gained consent that the projects will then be buildable. And I can, I can assure the committee that uh, the recent CFD round, the projects in Scotland were as economic, if not more economic than others. Our project in particular uh, was highly competitive and very, very uh, close to the winning bids. What we actually uh, lack is the certainty of the CFD process and this auction. We welcome, as a company, and I speak on behalf of my own company now, we, have, we operate in 13 or 14 different countries around the world. Uh, we are very, very used to auction processes. We're very, very used to strong competition. We have no problem with that whatsoever. But what we do need is, is a strong government and strong regulation and uh, control of the consenting and policy. And it has to be a, a cohesive uh, policy and delivery group. To have different policy groups, different delivery groups, one government responsible for one thing, one for another, and then local autonomy uh, responsible for a third stream makes it extremely complicated and, and, and almost impossible to get these projects through. You, you have a fantastic resource here in Scotland. We have an absolutely fantastic resource, but we're in danger of getting through a huge amount of expenditure, both by, the, by ourselves, by the public sector as well, because the Scottish Government has put a lot of effort, time and money into this. But we're still in danger of not delivering these projects. I've got a lot of people here who want to ask questions. I'm going to rattle through this as fast as we can, folks, because otherwise I'll not get through the other wide range of issues. I think Duncan and Lewis both wanted to have a quick supplementary here. Very, very quickly, I mean, I've found the session already very interesting in the divergence of views about how we should proceed um, and references to the Scottish Government on a couple of occasions. And, and you know, there's a bit of slight contradiction what you believe that the Scottish Government's um, uh, offer is to the islands and uh, it's been, you know, some of them named specifically and uh, the need to have a national focus on some of the development of these, these, these assets. Uh, have, have, have you any certainty that the Scottish Government and its officials at this point in discussions with the UK Government are shaping the Smith um, Commission's uh, recommendations to a subsequent bill that takes account of your view. Have you had any of those discussions, assurances from ministers or officials that, that, uh, that what you believe is the Scottish Government's objective uh, is, uh, are they working alongside you? Have you had any of these discussions? What assurances have you had that they're proceeding on a, a, on a line that would, that, 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 that would support your view? Angus is probably the person to pick this up because I know he's involved in the Ireland group. So. I think the, the Our Islands uh, Ministerial Working Group has met just recently with uh, the Minister, the new Minister for the Islands, which we very much welcome. Um, and we challenged just on exactly that point, and we've had a, an assurance that we will now start a piece of work where we shape the legislation that allows that to be delivered, and that's very much the expectation 
of the movement of islands in the future that that happens. Are, are you, were you reassured from that discussion that all revenues and assets would devolve to the islands or the local government? Being a, a sceptic, I, I remain to see and be assured when I see it in black and white. But can I say that the work we have done in terms of the Mysterio Working Group has been 100% followed through till now, so I would be very, very optimistic that that will follow through. Lewis? Yeah, coming back to some of the energy issues, I, I hear what Dan Finch says about energy policy, but he will appreciate the Smith Commission does not recommend devolution of control over energy policy. So, so my question really is, given that context, and given the clauses that are in front of us in relation to Crown Estate, what, in, what is the, and, and this would be a question I think for, for Angus as well and perhaps for others, um, what, what would be the um, optimum way in which this goes forward to support renewable energy? In other words, we've heard, we've heard discussion around devolution further to local government, we've heard discussion around uh, expertise within Crown Estates in terms of management and seabed and the importance of simplicity. Given the, given the um, arrangement that, are, that is here, do these clauses offer the right way forward for developers to be able to deal uh, effectively with the Crown Estates or their, their replacement? Dan, you I, th pick I think, yeah, just, just very, very briefly, I, and I'm probably going to reiterate what I've, some of what I've already said, is that I, I welcome some, the major, some of the skills that the Crown Estate has demonstrated, uh, some of the ability that the Crown Estate has demonstrated to act, uh, if you like, as a um, uh, more of a, a commercially facing uh, organisation than I would normally anticipate from local authorities, for example. Uh, I understand what uh, my panel colleague has said about the, the local authorities having a commercial bent and being able to operate, but you know, to, the, the ability to use funds in a particular way has been one of the benefits that the Crown Estate has, has, has demonstrated. For example, and I'm, I'm not here to sort of um, talk up the Crown Estate, so I assure you, but the, uh, they've spent in the region of £100 million uh, in supporting the development of, of the offshore wind industry. Uh, so these are monies that they've diverted from their revenues or wherever they, you know, they're for, from their budget. They've had the ability to invest in uh, technology development, uh, environmental management, a whole list of um, research work, for example, in how to drive the cost of energy down in the wind sector. And they're not doing it because they feel that they, you know, they're their charity or they feel that they should be supporting us as developers. They're doing it because they are trying to support a long-term revenue stream for, as, as it is at the moment, the UK. They're investing a lot of money in that. 100 million in anybody's books is a reasonable amount of money. Uh, and, and that may be very difficult for the individual local authorities to, um, to deal with, you know, to actually bring that, those sort of sums together. So there does need to be an, an, an element of central management in order for, and what the Crown are trying to do, and what, whoever, whatever decision you make, they must be trying to deliver government policy, and that is, in theory, what they've been doing so far. All right, that so, is a crucial factor for us. So essentially, essentially, what you're saying is that, from your perspective, why I think Angus Campbell might have a view, from your perspective, a, a, a united Crown estate is easier to deal with. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Oh, you're trying to put words into my mouth. No, I'm you, not. You I'm, I'm trying to draw out. I, I, okay. I, I, I am, I'm not favouring one view or the other. Simply trying I, I to think, draw out your view. I think a, a, a common arm or a common body on behalf of the Scottish Government, let's not call it whatever name it's going to be called, but it's you know, somebody that represents what you want to be delivered in Scotland. I guess Angus would have a, a slightly different perspective on it, but um, I, I need to just move, move on to other questions, Angus, but I'll come, let, let, let you come back. Alex? subjects were okay. <laughs> We've got two witnesses who have talked about a positive experience of the Crown Estate and we've got two witnesses who want to take over the, the functions effectively of the Crown Estate. The, from what I'm hearing uh, and having spoken to other people with interest in seabed in the North Sea for example, the, there is a fear of fragmentation, dispersal of expertise, uh, competition for investment in some cases, uh, and certainly uh, a, an environment where there are policy differences between local authorities that could make it difficult to achieve uh, results across local authority boundaries, for example. What can you say to me that will allow me 
to have these fears reduced? And Steve, you're on. <laughs> I mean, what I think I'm hearing is that the Scottish Government doesn't have the ability to do what the Crown Estate is doing at the moment in terms of setting the, the agenda, in, in terms of setting the, the strategic direction. Um, I mean, I, I just thought as you were speaking there, we've seen Palamas go out of business in the last few months. The Scottish Government's come in and created a body there to take that work forward. Um, the biggest barrier to us in, in renewables has been the, the really weird system of consents that have stopped the islands prospering as they have with sit with Westminster. Um, we've seen the policy being led by Scottish Government in that we worked alongside them. Um, I don't see why there's a fear that that part of work cannot be done within Scotland. I, f I find that, that really, really strange. I hear what individual companies... It can be done within Scotland, but are you suggesting that, as far as the Western Isles are concerned, it should be done within the Western Isles? I think at the highest strategic level, as I've said before, there is a layer there that belongs with the Scottish Government, just as if ownership can sit with the Scottish Government. What I would say is that we can go to a level in these islands where you see develops the working of developments through, we have a track record of doing it. We've had, for instance, in Lewis, a 650 megawatt development gone through the planning process very quickly. If you speak to developers in our area, they would say all the islands are very reactive to the needs of developers. You see at the moment up in Shetland, some of the biggest oil extensions you've seen anywhere. These are massive responsibilities on local authorities, but they do them, and they do them well. If you agree with that area of discussion, or do you want to add something more to it? I do wish to add something. Thanks, Chair. Make it succinct as you can. I'm sorry. I just need to move on from this area. I agree with Angus on, on all, of, all, all that he said, and that a blend of expertise and a blend of input from national and local government is essential to the future. I would I wish to add one point here, which is that there is a disconnect at the moment between um, the national interest, commercial interest, and local interests. And if I could give a, a short example of that, during the recent um, extremely bad weather in the Highlands, the communities which had suffered the greatest impact from renewables were those which were last reconnected to the grid. Um, we had the um, uh, shameful situation in which uh, small communities around Loch Ness, surrounded by wind farms, surrounded by the impact of this technology, beleaguered by commercial interests, were um, without power for seven days. We need to reconnect local communities to the impact, to the responsibilities and the benefits of decisions that are made. I'm not saying that decisions need to be made by small communities, but they need to have a much greater say in how those decisions are made. Ah, okay. Dan, Dan uh, you've, you've been quick enough. For, uh, uh, Andy, you want to reflect on that, and then I'm going to go to Tavish, and then I'm going to move on to a different subject with Mark, because I want to get transition issues on the... Well, just, just, just very briefly, I mean, I want to emphasise the fact that the Smith Commission and the command paper is not about how the uh, governance of the Crown property rights in Scotland are decentralised after devolution. That is a matter for this Parliament to consider. Um, it should start to consider it now, but it's a subject for it formally to consider after devolution, which is partly why I'm a bit concerned about the way in which the proposed devolution is to take place. Uh, and the scheme, which it seems to me has got the potential to preempt what the Parliament might decide to do, um, instead of being a fairly straightforward uh, devolution, dev, 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 devolution issue. It's also complicated by the fact that uh, there's a proposal that the Crown Estate Commissioners continue to have an involvement in Scotland after the power, the, the, the rights over which they currently have responsibility are devolved, which seems to me um, both improper and politically very complex. I think we're going to get a bit further into that when Mark asks, we're going to get into Mark's area question, but Tavish, I think you've got one commentary here. For me, and on. Just in passing, uh, the Smith Agreement was very clear about the devolution of powers within Scotland to the island areas, um, very clear indeed. Um, Mr Fincher, you make a perfectly reasonable point about your industry's concerns. It would be helpful to the committee if you could, if you could in writing, or the indus your industry could quantify those business costs that you believe would arise as a result of any additional tier of, of policy and all the rest of it. I would highlight to you, to Tal building a £2.5 billion 
Pound oil terminal, a gas terminal in, in uh, Shetland at the moment, and they don't have those concerns. They've been able to deal with UK government, uh, Scottish government, uh, Marine Scotland, and all the other regulatory bodies, including Shetland Lands Council's planning department, without those kind of concerns. So I think, you know, I think you need to be a little bit... If you can quantify it, fair enough. But if you can't quantify it, I think at the moment, frankly, a lot of this is assertion. We, we, we are very much welcome to put written evidence yeah. to, to yourselves. And what I would say, what I would actually would like to really stress is the fact that we have had fantastic cooperation and fantastic uh, um, work with all the local stakeholders, particularly Moray Council and Highland Council in the projects in which we work. The, you know, the, the, the assistance that we've received is absolutely first rate. What, what I'm trying to say is, and, and I'm very, very uh, quickly, Mr. Scott, is oil and gas is different because it's completely controlled and there is a, an actually a completely a cohesive uh, strategy on oil and gas throughout the entire UK. Uh, you know, a lot of the offshore is, is consented through deck, for example, so it is completely and utterly uh, a different case. We, 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 we actually deal in, in a completely different way. And, and if we, if we, one of the things I should stress is that it's all very well going through these development processes, it's all very well spending tens and tens of millions, and the local authorities are spending a lot of time and a lot of effort in actually trying to get this. And so are the local communities, you know, Fraserburgh, Bucky, Wick, all the local harbours that will benefit from these type of projects. But if we don't, if we don't actually build them, nobody benefits whatsoever. Nobody. All right. So we can spend as much time and as much effort, but if we don't have a joined-up process, then nobody benefits. Not my company, not the organisation, not the industry, and no jobs. So we need to get them through, and they're so large. Um, right. That's a tough challenge. Thank you very much, General. We're going to move into a slightly different area now um, about transition issues and get a bit more into these issues and get that on the record. Mark, would you like to kick us off on that? Yeah, um, obviously, we've, uh, certainly Andy has, has touched uh, or has, has gone into some depth in terms of his views around the transfer scheme. Um, but looking at, looking at the scheme as it currently is, is proposed, um, there's reference, obviously, to the, to the UK, explicit reference to the UK Treasury. Um, and given that Treasury has had involvement in the governance of the Crown Estate, is it still appropriate for it to be specifically referenced in the draft clauses? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. This is a, <clears throat> I can't think of another area of devolved responsibility where there's been some kind of residual um, responsibility left with institutions in London. So, for example, if you're going to devolve the management of these Crown property rights, that's what you do. You don't then say the Crown Estate Commissioners can continue to build up a, a new Crown Estate in Scotland, because that brings with it all sorts of consequential issues, such as, you know, shall they continue to have a Crown Estate Commissioner with special responsibility to Scotland? Shall it report to this committee? And equally, <clears throat> I don't see what role the Treasury has to play in this either. I mean, this is a, a matter of, should be a matter of straightforward devolution to the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Parliament then uh, decides how it wants to decentralise those assets beyond, beyond Edinburgh. The, uh, I don't know if any of the other witnesses have anything to offer on, on that specific question, or in which case I'll move on to... Um, sorry, yeah, Mr Finch. Apologies for this, but um, I think I've already said this, really, but to be honest, in another way, is that uh, both Treasury and DEC uh, retain control of uh, the, the processes by which projects either go ahead or they do not. Um, so, irrespective of this, if, and I understand what the Deputy Convener says about this is not part of, or sorry, it was Mr MacDonald, uh, says that this is not part of the, the, the devolved uh, powers in this case at this time. Um, but um, I would urge that we keep these, these this, in, this uh, I'm trying to avoid the word interference, but this involvement to a minimum so that the Scottish Government can deliver what the Scottish Government wants to deliver. So, uh, the, there's also reference in the command paper uh, to an intention to transfer to the Scottish Parliament the competence to legislate uh, on management of Scottish assets before the transfer scheme, um, although there's not a great amount of detail about that. Um, do any of the panel have any inclination as to what the reason for this would be and what might that earlier competence be used for before the transfer scheme comes into effect? I don't know if Andy, you want to maybe kick off? Address that. I'm unclear as to why this is being proposed. Clearly, uh, once the... And all we're talking about devolving here are the property rights and interests of the Crown. Um, obviously, if you devolve them, you have to then be in a position to 
handle the ongoing administration, the contracts already been entered into over pipelines and renewable energy and farm tenancies and all sorts of stuff. Um, so there has to be a transition period where the administration of those rights is sorted out here before the actual power takes effect. That's, that's not a problem. But I, 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 I am concerned that the reason why this is talked about in rather opaque terms uh, in um, the command paper 55 11 is that there is some suggestion that these powers will not be transferred until such time as the Parliament has itself developed a scheme of decentralisation. Now, that is not necessary in order to uh, implement the Smith Commission. Uh, you need to make sure that the Scottish ministers will inherit all the duties and functions of the Crown Estate Commissioners immediately, but it's up to Parliament how then you decentralise those functions to local authorities, how you might have a scheme giving ports and harbours the right to uh, take ownership of, of, of the seabed, etc. That's a, a consequential thing. So I think the committee should be very, very assiduous in its, its questioning both of the government and, and other witnesses as to what, in fact, is the intent here, because I detect the, the, the hand of the Crown Estate Commissioners themselves in the framing of this, the, 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 the uh, proposal that they continue to have an involvement. Um, and I just think this is a recipe for chaos. Perhaps in, 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 in different terms, do you think that what, what's being suggested there and what you seem to be implying is that a cart is being put before a horse, that essentially the, uh, the transfer would, would require for preparation for the powers before the powers have come and before the detail of what exactly the scheme delivers is known and that would that would be difficult to to put together well uh, clause 558 and 5511 contradict each other so it's difficult to interpret what what, what they mean um I, I don't see any need for a scheme um there are clearly Issues to be sorted about, about defence, national security, ongoing commitments, liabilities and all the rest of it. Those are administrative things. Those can be done under a piece of secondary legislation or, or, or a memorandum of understanding or whatever is appropriate. But as it's proposed, they're in the face of the bill. When all that needs to be in the face of the bill is a few simple legislative amendments such that authorities transferred to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, but you're right, there does need to be this transition. There does need to be the Scottish Parliament and ministers need to be ready to take on these responsibilities before the devolution actually takes effect. But that process shouldn't be used to preempt what the Parliament might wish to do with those powers. Just, we've just had a Section 30 order in relation to votes at 16 and 17, which obviously was done on a, a fast track timescale, quite rightly so. Uh, the, the amendments and the, the alterations that you suggest, are they things that could be done out with the scope of a, of, of a single bill that could be done in a, in a quicker timescale than what is being envisaged in terms of the delivery of the Smith proposals? No, the, the, the legislative <coughs> clauses that I could include in my written evidence are things that would be in the face of the Scotland <coughs> Bill 2016 or whatever. <coughs> but... Yes, but there, there may be a case for a Section 30 order to grant to the Scottish Parliament the power to legislate over the administration and management of Crown property rights so that it can, at an early stage, so that it can begin to do the detailed consideration <coughs> about decentralisation, <coughs> for example. Now, I mean, the Parliament could have that discussion anyway, but it would be out with legislative competence. So I think that would be a, an interesting and possibly useful thing to do. Thanks. Yeah. you two have had there, but I'd rather pick out other views before I move on to supplementaries. Does MDLs else want to reflect any of that evidence that was given at Walter? Just qu quickly on the transition, the, um, the last thing that, that industry needs or, or tenants of the Crown Estate within the aquaculture sector need is a long, protracted, drawn-out process which doesn't allow business as usual to carry on. I think it's very important, whichever decision is made, that somehow or other business as usual for existing tenants and industries is allowed to carry on without interruption and uncertainty. Angus, I see you nodding. You just want to put that on the record? So that yeah, I'd just like to agree with that. I think it's very important that we take a simple approach to this, that we, we do it in a way that everybody understands what's happening. Economic activity uh, isn't damaged with that. And can I make it clear, we're not looking at another layer here. We're looking at a moving of responsibilities from one place to the other. We're not creating another layer. And quickly. I'd just like to add to that as well, you know, that as simple and as timely as possible, really. Um, we, 
uh, you know, time moves on. The next uh, bidding round for the UK CFDs will take place at the end of the summer, depending on the uh, up and coming election, hopefully. Um, and and if, if, there's, if it's not a simple approach, then we won't qualify. You know, if there's any doubt about it, then Scottish projects will be disadvantaged again. Okay. Listen, I'm going to take a few supplementaries now. Um, I think it was Alison first, and then I'm going to come to Lewis. Yeah, I'm probably going to... Thank you, Convener. I'm going to direct my question to Andy Whiteman. Um, after... You spoke about confusion, conflict and chaos, um, and point out that after the transfer, the Crown Estate will still be able to invest in Scotland. That although effectively there will no longer be a Crown Estate, um, the Crown Estate Commissioner will still be able to acquire land and property, which would be administered and managed by the Crown Estate Commissioner. Why do you think that... Uh, what are your specific concerns about that? And why do you think it's being allowed to continue? Uh, I don't know why. There's two broad concerns. One is political, one's legal. Um, I don't understand why, in the same breath, one would devolve the administration and management and then Phoenix-like, a new Crown Estate would arise from the ashes of this devolution scheme uh, to be continued to be administered and managed exactly as it is just now. Because the important thing to remember is that any property that Crown Estate Commissioners acquire is not theirs. They don't own any land. Um, <clears throat> it's all acquired in the name of a third party, the Crown. And so any property that they acquire in Scotland is owned by the Crown in Scotland. And that leads me to my second point, which is that the Crown in Scotland is a separate legal entity from the Crown in the rest of the United Kingdom. The Treasury Committee uh, inquiry makes this uh, uh, clear. Um, and the Scottish Parliament has authority over the property rights, for example, Crown property rights. So the Crown Estate Commissioners could find themselves acquiring land in Scotland and then the Scottish Parliament might nationalise those rights. Uh, it, it seems to be, I, I just don't understand why you would, why you would devolve you know, transport, health, education and then have some residual responsibility for an organisation outside Scotland continue to have that same involvement. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. That is um, fairly clear. Um, I want to ask about a specific property, an onshore interest that, that seems to have been retained, Fort Canaird, a property in, in my region. It's held in a limited partnership, half owned by the Crown Estate and half owned by a Jersey-based unit trust. It has been excluded from the proposed transfer, and I just wonder if, why you think that might be the case in this particular instance. I mean, you, you may not know it all, but it, it's like a mega shopping mall um, um, uh, on the outskirts of, of the city. Probably a very profitable shopping yes. mall, um, and I just wondered what your views were on the retention. Other than to say that it's not a straightforward, it's a, it's, um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a joint property partnership and it, it may, there may be legal reasons why it's not straightforward to devolve that, I don't know. Convener, could I ask one very short question? Um, I, you have suggested a different legislative approach. Um, you know, you, you've suggested that sections should be repealed which effectively reserve the Crown State and I just wonder why you think we have been presented with a an entirely different approach to the one you would advocate. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Lewis. Well, uh, I think on that point I'm, I'm keen to pursue it a little bit because Andy Whiteman said in introduction this does not implement Smith, but, but, but I, I, I fail to see the basis for that. I think what you've put forward is an alternative way of implementing that. Would you accept that that's fair comment, that there are two different ways that this could be done and the scheme adequately implements the commitments? even if it's not in the way that you might choose? Well, I think well, the problem with the scheme is the scheme opened up the potential to frustrate Smith's intentions. That's why? the problem. Why, why, do you, why, why is that true? Because it's open to substantial negotiation. This has to be agreed between Treasury and Scottish ministers. When it seems to me the straightforward uh, case for devolution is addressed by a few simple legislative amendments. And that, the public would understand that. But, but is the essence of Smith not the negotiation? Of devolution from no, one government. No, I don't to think so. I mean, Smith makes quite clear in Para 32 that they want to devolve the administration and management. Now, I think any competent legislative process does that as simply and straightforwardly and transparently as possible. Uh, Lord Smith also made very clear in the Scottish Affairs Committee that the job, I quote, the job we were given was to devolve to Holyrood. That's the job. Yeah. It's not to preempt anything else the Scottish Parliament may f subsequently do. And I, I fear that within the scheme, that opens up scope for negotiations to take place and complexities to be introduced that effectively tie the hands of the Parliament. I, I, I look at the, amend the proposal in your own paper and read five 
specific points, and then I read there may be a few more consequential amendments. Is that not an acknowledgement that however this is done, there will have to be a scheme of adjustment in the legislative provisions? Well, the consequential amendments will be to other little acts that reference the Crown Estate Commissioners, and will be acts all over the place, about Ports Act, etc. That's a normal part of legislation. Absolutely. And, and I wasn't going to troll through them all. <laughs> no, no, I understand that. I'm not asking you to do that. But presumably that's something government lawyers will do in, in providing a scheme. We'll look at what but the consequences a scheme, are. I, I, can't think of, I can't think of any other process of devolution where we have invented a scheme to devolve what is a very straightforward matter of the administration and management of Crown property rights. The, the I simply don't understand why we need this complicated scheme. One of the things you said just a few moments ago was that you were concerned about the scheme because it might delay the devolution of authority over the Crown Estates until the Scottish Parliament had taken steps to devolve further to local authorities. I think that fairly summarises what you, what you no, said. No, I wasn't concerned that it would delay it. I was concerned that it would preempt it by binding the hands of the Parliament, by making it difficult for the Parliament to act of its own free will from Parliament to Parliament as to what it does with these rights because they're already tied up in statute in the scheme. To, to, to devolve them further to local government? To decentralise. And is that not precisely what Smith says? Smith said, uh, it's quite important to understand what Smith did say. In paragraph 33, he said that there will be further devolution. That's not something, however, that the, the command paper should take any uh, detailed interest in because the political parties have signed up to that. In fact, uh, Lord Smith himself, as I said, the job we were given was to devolve to Holyrood. Uh, then goes on to say, question 142 in the Scottish Revision Committee in uh, December 2014, L5, every word that is in here was signed up to by the political parties. And when the but, political parties say will be, that is an intention. But, but do you not accept that the purpose of, this, of the clauses is to implement Smith? And Smith says devolve to local government. No, I don't accept that. I do not think, um, Lord Smith himself, the job we were given no, no. was to devolve to Holyrood. The Smith agreement in word says decentralisation to authorities such as the island authorities. Yes, but I think those arrangements come after the devolution to the Parliament. It's a two-stage process. But this is implementing Smith. I think that's really my one. My okay, point. I think that's all on the record now. Um, Stuart, and then I think in the last bit, person in this particular area, Linda, I think you said you wanted in as well. Okay, I'll come back to you later. Stuart. Uh, thanks, uh, Kim Richards. It's a very uh, brief uh, supplementary to this area. Um, just in terms of the, the devolution of the Crown Estate um, to Scotland uh, and uh, the transitional uh, period, uh, is there an argument that uh, there's also already a precedent there uh, in, in terms of Scotland and uh, when the Scottish canals come into being, when British waterways ceased to have any, any dealings with, uh, with the canal infrastructure and assets and liabilities in Scotland? The British Waterways Board Transfer of Functions Order 2012 was a, um, <clears throat> the transfer of functions of a cross-border authority, of which there are 30 or 40. Uh, but the key difference between that and this current arrangement is that canals were already devolved in 1998. What was being devolved in the order in 2012 was the functions of a cross-border authority. Uh, what we've got in the case of the Crown Estate Commissioners is we've got a, a UK-wide body, the Crown Estate Commissioners, who administer Crown land in Scotland, which is Scottish public land. Um, uh, and the management and administration of that land was not devolved in 1998. It was retained, it was reserved. So this is a full scheme of devolution, as it were. It's not simply the, the splitting up of a cross-border authority. Okay, no, that's helpful, thank you. Stuart, while you're on your feet, or using the microphone at least. Okay. Can you just deal with the issue of aquaculture sure. you're interested in as well? Because I think that would certainly help Lord yeah. Spears get sure. some okay. contribution here. No, thank you. Um, so in terms of the, the issue of the, the aquaculture and the, obviously the seabed, uh, the county states obviously get the, the, the control of the seabed up to 12 nautical miles. Um, and there's been an issue of the, the fish farming operations uh, requir requiring the Crown Estate lease. And so in terms of the, 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 uh, the challenges and opportunities for the aquaculture industry uh, under the proposed new regime, what, what would you say they actually are? Well, I think that, first of all, the Scottish Government is very supportive of the expansion of uh, aquaculture as a very important industry in Scotland. The as tenants of the, of the Crown Estate, the Crown Estate are good landlords. I don't think the aquaculture industry has, has any issues with that whatsoever. Um, and so 
the biggest threat to the aquaculture industry would be a period of uncertainty. If we enter into a period where, where we don't really quite know who the landlord is, who the regulator is, um, that's, that, that would be negative. At the moment, I don't think the aquaculture industry have any gripes whatsoever with the current management of the assets in Scotland, which is why I thought that the best thing going forward would be, would be to leave that existing structure in place for managing those assets on behalf of the Scottish Government and instead of behalf of, of the Crown Estate based in, based in Westminster. Okay. Uh, so, I, mean, I could also add into the, the issue of aquaculture uh, the situation regarding uh, marine tourism. Uh, and this afternoon, um, there's going to be the launch of the, of the first uh, National Marine Tourism uh, Strategy that's taking place in Glasgow. Uh, and so, so, uh, so in terms of going forward uh, with, uh, with aquaculture and with marine tourism and that sector, uh, do you see any potential conflict of interest for local authorities potentially uh, granting planning permission uh, and letting leases uh, for fish farms and also other activities regarding marine tourism? Local authorities already have the planning consent. They have the power to consent or not aquaculture development. So that isn't going to change. Um, whether or not, irrespective of what happens with the, the revenue from those developments, it, it's not going to change that local authorities have the power to approve or reject an aquaculture development. But we heard, we heard earlier on this morning uh, the, the issue of uh, the regulator and, uh, and the beneficiary. Uh, do you see a conflict of interest there if... Uh, the powers were further devolved? Well, there obviously was perceived to be a conflict in 1999 or we wouldn't have had the change, but um, the, the, I guess the, it's, it's, a per, it's, it's a perception rather than perhaps a reality, but if someone is both landlord and consenting, then there would be perceived to be a conflict that would mean that if you grant someone planning permission, it would be to your financial gain. But that's a sort of slightly hypothetical argument, but it was the one that led to the changes in 1999. Mm. Is there any particular issues, Walter, that you want to put on the record where you've got the chance on aquaculture in that, in that particular area without going on too yep, long about very it? Very quickly, and I think it's probably back to what Mr Gibson said <coughs> about, about the five areas. I think that the planning already is under the control of local authorities, so, so that doesn't need to be changed. And yeah, I think you also mentioned Marine Scotland, and would they be... I, th I think that, with no disrespect to Marine Scotland, they've really got their hands full at the moment with the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and the Marine Bill, and I think that's been discussed recently in Parliament. So the last thing we would want, I think, is for this workload to be given to uh, a body that is already pretty busy. Any other reflections on agriculture issues before I move on? Angus? Just, just very quickly, I think if you speak to to aquaculture developers in the Western Isles, of which there are very, very many, it's a very big part of our economy. I think they would uh, agree that the local authority has been a very active partner in the development of that industry. We're now seeing a change in how that industry works in terms of less localised, smaller uh, enterprises moving to bigger ones. It's important that the local benefit of that still remains in some way back into the system. I really have an issue with... Um, What's been alluded at that there is a problem with um, permissions being given for activities that actually bring benefit to the area that you represent and that you cannot differentiate that. If you apply that right across the board to all the activities that local government do, indeed to what Scottish government does, you are going to prevent anything happening. It is not impossible to have an open and fair system. Thank you very much. Um, I think, Rob, you wanted some questions on land issues in Highland Estates. I've got that right. Section on uh, uh, landed matters. Um, Glenlivet Estates, 57,000 acres. Fockerbur Estates, uh, 11,300, maybe around about 700 leases within these. Um, there seems to be some resistance to the idea uh, on these landed estates of them becoming uh, the responsibility of the local council. Um, do you think there's a difference between dealing with the offshore issues which we've been talking about and the way in which land might be managed uh, by local authorities? I, I don't see a conflict there. I think we're in a lucky position in, in uh, the Western Isles where we already have 68% of our land masses owned by the communities. I think we have a very good track record of... Um, of managing that. That's going to increase as time goes on. And one of the important outcomes from that is that the economic activity on that land has actually improved. It's made um, a much better economy for people to live and work in. 
I don't see why that ethos cannot apply to to our input into the land that's privately owned, but maybe paying something back to the Crown Estate at the moment. So perhaps the answer for people in uh, Glenlivet and Fochabers is to go for a community buyout then, and uh, they wouldn't have to be controlled by a local authority. We have very good experience of that, and can we also make it clear that um, a request for, for control over the assets does not stop at the local authorities in any way, in any part, that there should be ways of this working its way down into local communities. We have even in renewables at the moment in the West Niles, a West Niles Development Trust that makes sure that it's, the benefits are spread right across our communities. And Andy Whiteman wants to go. Let's, let's, let's see if Steve has got any perspective from the Highlands as well, and I'll come to Andy there. Thanks, Convener. Yes, again, I agree with Angus in that um, I think the issue here really is about um, supporting fragile communities and allowing communities to be close to decision-making enhances social cohesion and I think that the Community Empowerment Bill takes us in that direction and gives us, gives us all of the um, means that we need to, to allow um, decisions to be made in the best interest of local communities. Reflect on some of that? No, just briefly to, to, to confirm, of course, that the, 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 um, the landlord is not changing under this scheme. The landlord remains, <clears throat> remains the Crown. Uh, what we're talking about is who administers those property rights. Uh, and I think that's a discussion that should be had. Clearly, we need, we, we need to discuss how the property rights in, in the, the landed estates are, are administered. And that's a conversation that should begin now and it should be discussed in Parliament. But again, as I say, that's something that is a decision, a legislative decision that would, should be made after the powers are devolved. Okay. Anything else, Rob? No. Okay. Um, I've got a question, Chris, because I'm unclear about something, and maybe you folk can help me. If, if you can't help me, I'll be asking the Crown Estate folk later. There's three different zones explained, I think, in, uh, in all of this, uh, in, as far as the seabed area is concerned. The exclusive economic zone, the Scottish zone, and the Scottish maritime zone. And this phrase, the Scottish zone, is certainly used in the Smith Commission in, in the draft clauses. I just wonder, does anyone there can explain to me what all these different zones are and are the clauses clear enough to make sure that we all understand exactly what we're talking about? Anyone have a go at that? I, mean, I don't recall which clauses in the command paper relate to zones. Do you have numbers? Clause 23 refers to a, Sc a Scottish zone, but doesn't mention at the same time the exclusive economic zone, so I'm not sure what the Scottish zone is. OK. <clears throat> well, what's being devolved, or what's being proposed to be devolved, are the property rights and interests held by the Crown. And in terms of the, the sea, uh, they fall into two, two distinct categories, in, in my view. One is the territorial waters out to 12 miles, which is part, legally part of Scotland. And the second is the zone beyond that, out to 200 miles, which is the UK continental shelf, economic exclusive area, etc., over which the Crown has certain property rights. So there's, there's really just two. I mean, you could add the foreshore, of course, but that's not really the sea. So, so I, I really, are you saying then, Andy, you, you, in interest of clarity, that would, understanding what that description, Scottish zone, means, because it's something new, I think, put into the clauses, would that, would, I think we need more clarity. Clarification around it. Is MDLs able well, to help? Could I just repeat the, 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 the yeah. best description of what the Crown property rights are in Scotland is in Figure 9 in the Land Reform Review Group. Okay. So one is ownership of the seabed, excluding harbour hydrocarbons within Scotland's territorial seas out to the 12 mile nautical limit, where this has not been granted out, and two rights over the continental shelf, that's 12 to 200, mm -hmm. to minerals excluding hydrocarbons and sedentary species from Scotland's territorial seas to the 200 mile nautical limit. Okay. Those are the rights. No, okay. So it's time for the Crown Estates are going to have to answer that one then. And Angus, unless you're some sort of expert, you can tell us about this. No, I'm not an expert. I don't have that skills. But in all our discussions, the, the three areas we talked about was the foreshore, out to 12 miles limit, and, and further out um, to continental. That's that was it. Okay, but this particular description's come into the clause, which I've, I'd never heard of until now. So. There is a, a question you may wish to address, which is what happens in the area of off Berwick that was subject to the, the adjacent boundaries order in 1999, which is uh, not clear to me in relation to the Crown property rights. OK, thank you. Could, could, I, sorry, Mr. Could, I, could I just add one point that there are some anomalies between the way it's treated within the 12 mile limit and outside the 12 mile limit <laughs> and, and uh, the way the Crown has reacted to developers within the 12 mile limit and outside. So, for example, we have different lease agreements, different AFLs, uh, agreements for lease, etc. 
and I think this is something we would certainly welcome is clarified in, in when we go forward. We, we, for example, because my projects are with, out with the 12 mile limit, pay a different lease premium. And this has made it, uh, we are uh, constrained competitively compared with projects that are within the 12 mile limit for some unknown reason. Oh, that's great. Could you write to us about that, Dan? And I will. Try to explain that a bit more to us because if there are constraints there, if we can sort them out as part of this process, and if sorting them is the sustainable thing to do, then obviously we need to look at that. Certainly well, Mr. Convener. Thank you. Um, I think, Linda, I think you're. you're yes, a I, I, yeah, it's a, it's a sort of general um, issue that I'd like to comment on. I mean, I mean, I think everybody here knows that we've been talking around these issues for years and years and years and years at Westminster, at, at Holyrood, the last Scotland Bill Committee, etc. And I think Tavish would agree with me that we recognised that when we sat in the Smith Commission and we wanted to get this right. We wanted to get it right in the initial stages so that we can then get it right further down the line in terms of further devolution, etc. And I know that there's a lot of aspirations that, that have built up with people uh, like yourselves on the panel over the years at what you feel could be achieved. And I, I would just like your view as to whether the Smith Agreement as put forward met some of these aspirations in terms of what could be achieved and whether you feel that the draft clauses as now submitted uh, could in fact meet these aspirations. <laughs> this goes through more and more legal scrutiny. There's going to be more clauses and more clauses and more additions in it and it's not going to be simple. I just want to reiterate the key thing would be if you could leave the customer facing side of this operation in place Whilst all this happens behind the scenes, that would be, I think, of tremendous benefit to people who are tenants and depend on a working relationship with the Crown Estate at the moment. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I, th I oh, think Dan? We, we as an organisation believe that it's, it's not up to us, it's up to the Scottish people to determine what they want. And, you know, they've spoken about what they want and you're representing them. Um, what we would like, though, is just the ability to be able to compete and to be able to develop you know, the resources that we think are, are fantastic and are here. Uh, and, and to make that as not as simple as possible because this you know, it's bound to be complicated, but to make it a level playing field. Um, but we, we, we accept whatever uh, the Scottish Government uh, deems to be the way that they want to take this forward. We think as long as there is a, a, a strong, cohesive strategy, and that's always been the case on energy in Scotland, but there's as much of that if the Scottish Government can control as much of that as possible from you know, the, the, the resource to the actual power being distributed, then that's, that's good for us as an as a energy company. I just say in addition to comments, oh, sorry, I've, made, <coughs> comments I've made previously, <coughs> the, uh, the command paper clauses <coughs> excuse me, open up by saying the Treasury may make a scheme. Uh, that, to my mind, is not what the Smith Commission, which you served on, intent. It's not to give the Treasury the option to make a scheme. Um, devolution should happen, will happen. Um, and that's not what is in the command paper. Thank you. Angus, you want to come Just in? to say that what we don't want to see is that uh, an easy solution for the customer facing, facer is at the cost of what our communities have. What we're looking at is not a short-term fix here. We're looking at putting a system into place that will deliver benefits to our communities for many years going on. Can I say we were pleased with the Smith Commission that it actually, in paragraph 33, that responsibility for the management of those assets will be further devolved to local authorities to areas such as Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles. That was a significant marker, even if it was over and above what maybe Smith was charged to doing. I think it's, for us, Looking at the outcomes, we want to see that translated into the legislation that comes from here. And that is the main point that we're trying to get today. I think on energy generally, the islands would very much back as much control coming back to Scottish Government so we get a simpler system and deliver some of the, 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 the fantastic assets we've got. This is indeed a, a significant marker. And if I could just remind the committee that the specific mentions of the island authorities do not include the mainland authorities and Murray, Highland and Argyll and Butte have much to gain here. Or other areas. We hope so. <laughs> One point, just to make sure there's clarity here, because Andy touched on a, a part on the 
from section 23 of the, the cl clauses where it says the Treasury may make a scheme transferring on the transfer date all of the existing Scottish functions. Would you accept that actually what the clauses are not actually devolving um, powers at the stage are giving the Treasury power to devolve? And is that satisfactory? I know what Andy's view is, so, but I haven't heard a view from other people. I think you probably have heard uh, uh, my opinion on this, is that it's, it's, it's difficult unless um, there is one government or one government yeah. controlling the entire delivery but it, but of renewables. It's more about Dan, the, pro the process here, though. I think no, no one's disputing the fact that, that the clauses try to devolve uh, in the way. It might not be the way everybody likes the clauses to be, that they try to devolve it, but it's the process that's actually saying the Treasury will bring forward the scheme. The clauses themselves do not allow for devolution. And I just wondered if there was a reflection on that specific point. Angus, maybe not. But. I'm sorry, I probably haven't caught on to that and seen that through, but my understanding was that uh, it would be a devolution process to the Scottish Government. Well, the, it's quite... Well, and that's I'll read it again. Just, but you might want to go away and reflect on this and come back to yeah. us then, because it says quite clearly, Section 23, 90B, the Treasury may make a scheme transferring on the transfer date all of the existing Scottish functions of the Crown Estate Commissioners so, uh, so people are absolutely aware of that. It's an important matter. I didn't understand that. But okay. I, I, that's not the spirit of what I thought was intended. So that's, so that's why I need you to come back to us and give us some evidence that, to reflect on that point, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for your attendance today. It's been helpful. It's certainly thrown up a lot of issues we need to consider. Uh, and thank you for giving us your time and your expertise in this area. And uh, at this stage, I'll close the meeting. To we suspend the meeting, sorry, till we take, uh, go into the next session. Thank you very much.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we reconvene and uh, welcome our visitors for the second session of witness giving today on the Crown Estate issues. And we'll just go straight into recognising who's here. I think that would be helpful. <coughs> We've got Alan Laidlaw, uh, the Rural and Coastal Portfolio Manager in Scotland for the Crown Estate. Uh, we have Gareth Baird, who's the Crown Estate Commissioner for Scotland. Vivian King, who's the Director of Business Operations and General Counsel for the Crown Estate. And we have Ronnie Quinn, who's the Head of Ocean Energy and Energy and Infrastructure Lead Scotland. That's quite a title, Ronnie. Um, <laughs> um, I think, Gareth, if I've got this right, you're going to act as a sort of chair for, for, for your panel. Uh, and you'd like to just make two or three minutes opening statement. So if you want to do that, please feel free to commence. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, convener. And thank you for giving the Crown Estate the opportunity to provide oral evidence to the committee today and for allowing me to make a few opening remarks. I will be brief. I am one of the Crown Estate's commissioners, that is, a member of the main board of the Crown Estate. I am also a Scottish commissioner, appointed to ensure the board is fully aware of and gives proper consideration to Scottish interests. And I'm joined today by the, my colleagues who the convener uh, kindly introduced there. Alan and Ronnie uh, form our Scottish leadership team and in her role as general counsel, Vivian is leading our work <coughs> excuse me, on preparation for Crown Estate devolution. Convener, I'd like to place on record my enormous pride and admiration for the Crown Estate staff in Scotland and the great work they perform day in and day out. They are a small team, just 38 people, but the vast knowledge and expertise they possess means they punch well above their weight. Whether it's minimising the risks facing developers in the consenting process for offshore, offshore wind, or encouraging new entrants to farming, or supporting the aquaculture industry, or establishing local management agreements, our team has a unique breadth and depth of expertise which has served Scotland well for many years. I know the staff will carry these strengths forward into whatever new devolved arrangements are introduced. Indeed, to that end, our team is already working hard to prepare for a smooth and prompt transfer of our Scottish management functions. We will continue to perform strongly up to the handover and beyond, and we'll do all that we can to minimise uncertainty for our customers, staff and the communities we work with across Scotland. We are very keen to engage with the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Ministers and local government to help find a pragmatic and workable way of implementing the Scotland Bill provisions relating to the Crown Estate in Scotland. In closing, convener, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to give evidence to the committee. My colleagues and I will do all we can to assist you in your deliberations. Yeah, thank you very much, Gareth. One thing I'm certainly acute with, with individually is you've got a body of staff who are who work for you, and obviously they'll, they'll have issues and concerns as we go through this, and we need to be careful to be respecting their, your relationship with them as part of this process, so I recognise that. We've had a lot of sectoral questions around the table earlier, uh, colleagues, um, but I think probably the best thing to do is try to get the issues of devolution arrangements and the, and the transition stuff at, at the beginning on the record and out of the way, because that's a big issue for the Crown Estate, obviously, and then we'll get into the other areas of interest. So with that, Mark, you led on that as part of the, the, the previous debate, and I'll, so I'll just kick off with you. Yeah, so first of all, I suppose, what, what, what role have you had in terms of the discussions around the development and the drafting of, of the clause, uh, and uh, with whom has that involvement been? Uh, maybe, uh, Mr McDonnell, just before we kick off on that, if I may, um, just to show you that the attitude, the positive attitude that our team has taken, uh, the Crown Estate team initiated discussions with Scottish ministers or the Scottish government teams four days after the announcement of the, Crown, of the Smith recommendations. And to give you the detail of that, I'll pass over to Vivian. Yes, thank you. Um, our um, involvement um, has been one of informing and providing technical input because um, we're the ones who've got the in-depth knowledge and understanding of, of our portfolio, of our business. Um, so it's been for us to ensure that um, Treasury, who we've been um, liaising with, um, are adequately informed um, to enable them um, to, do, to perform the role of government. So 
We've been providing um, um, a, a, a range of information about the business, um, things like definitions of, of the business, um, the, uh, the, the Scottish zone that was mentioned uh, earlier, and um, in areas where, for instance, you know, our seabed has, um, has, a, has an interacting um, focus alongside um, other sectors, deck and MOD and so on. So we've been, we've been providing that level um, of information. It's a complex business. I think the complexity of it shouldn't be uh, misunderstood and we're able to inform the process um, as a consequence of, of our knowledge, like we're informing the committee today. And in fact, um, as we've started to inform uh, Scottish government officials, um, already, um, I'm, um, I'm, I have a counterpart uh, amongst Scottish government officials of uh, Graham Dixon, and we've been talking to Graham and Linda and David Mallon and others um, about this um, specifically. Okay, um, we had some evidence earlier, which you were in for, um, that uh, certainly Andy Whiteman considers that there is a, a much less convoluted method of devolution uh, of the functions of the Crown Estate. Um, do you take a view on, on the, the, the method that he has highlighted and is it one that you would be relaxed with if it were suggested as, a, as an alternative way to devolve these functions? Yes, I, um, I, 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 I listened to that and I, I read the written submission that um, um, was put forward to this committee. I'm not actually persuaded that it would be faster um, or simpler. Um, I, think, I think it has uh, a real risk of trailing wires. Uh, we are looking for absolute clarity um, in, the, in relation to the transfer of the management um, functions of the Crown Estate so that... Um, from the point of, uh, of transfer, so day one after transfer, um, the business that we've been running as successfully as we have been running is in a position to continue running to, to that standard with customers um, understanding exactly where they stand in relation to us. The um, proposal that's been suggested um, doesn't actually implement the transfer. That's something that would, that would follow. Um, it doesn't deal with, with the enormous amount of detail that's involved in transferring a business such as ours. There is a lot more to it than administration, as my portfolio colleagues can explain to you. Um, and it also doesn't deal with um, the, uh, the, the, the stakeholders that um, are recognised um, um, in uh, DEC and MOD. So I'm not, uh, I'm not convinced um, about uh, that um, being the best route at all. My firm belief um, uh, is that a statutory transfer scheme um, is the ideal vehicle. Of course, this is a matter that's um, being led by, by Treasury, um, but I'm very supportive of it. And in fact, um, if I were to take my Crown Estate hat off and um, if I were to be coming to you and I were to be advising you on what's the best way of ensuring that this complex business is transferred in the smoothest and most efficient and most comprehensive way, I would say let's get it all done and dealt with up front um, so that everybody knows what's being transferred. Um, a statutory transfer scheme is a commonly used form of secondary legislation um, to implement um, the outlines that uh, primary legislation would identify where there's just too much um, detail to be included in the primary legislation. And that absolutely fits um, the model of our business. It is a very complex um, business. So the beauty of a, of a statutory transfer scheme is, first of all, it would implement the transfer in one step. Um, it would capture all of the detail around that uh, a business um, in one place. It's very transparent. Um, it, it, it will um, call for input from ourselves, from Scottish Government and, and other stakeholders. So everybody has a chance to input to it. And it minimises the uncertainty. So it's a, very, it's, a very, it's a very public process and customers are very clear um, about where they will stand post-transfer before that transfer happens. So it's essentially getting all your ducks in a row before you make the transfer happen. 
I, I appreciate that, and, and very, very briefly, if I may, convener. Um, at the same time, though, you, you've, you've said on more than one occasion about uh, getting this transfer all done and dusted, but even after the transfer of powers uh, and um, the administration and management, there will still be a potential that the Crown Estate will continue to invest, uh, build up a portfolio and have a role in Scotland after that transfer takes place, as things are currently drafted. Do you think that's appropriate? Um, well, it's been suggested that that's unworkable, and I'm not sure why. Um, I, I, I don't think it would create confusion, and there are other uh, Crown-owning bodies um, in Scotland where we aren't um, managers, we're not involved. Um, and um, you know, we, we are um, uh, a successful business. We um, 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 are beating our market benchmarks um, on a consistent basis. And we would simply be one investor alongside others um, wishing to include Scotland as a, as a place to invest. That is where we left off effectively in the last discussion area with the particular um, Section 2390B clause. Uh, would it not also be possible to draw up legislation that devolved and in that devolution say that the Crown Estate function will be devolved from a certain date in the future and in the meantime it will be the, 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 a transfer scheme, a member of, under, a member of understanding could be drawn up just as adequately as is currently designed in the clause? Well, the, 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 the transfer scheme um, will enable everything to be handled in one place um, and it will actually implement the transfer of management um, to, um, to, 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 Scottish, to Scottish Government. So it's, it is, it's, it's a case of organising everything sufficiently up front and then using that as the simple step to implement that transfer. Well, okay, I understand that, and mm. I think everyone can accept there needs to be a, an adequate transfer scheme that's got to deal with the complexity and the, and the, the deep nature of this, your organisation. But that could be done at any time after the power was devolved at a given date in the future and a transfer scheme uh, a, a arrangement brought into place at the same time. But that would create um, um, uncertainty for, for our markets, for our customers, for our staff um, who wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have that clarity on um, where, where, the, where uh, the transfer precisely was going to go. And it also wouldn't as I said, a date in the future that was defined when that transfer would take place, that certainty would be there? Well, um, in, in, it's, it's my view that um, there should be that clarity that happens um, and is, cre is created um, with a scheme up front and can put, be put into place with, the, uh, with, with, with legislation. OK. Lewis? Yeah, just to follow, follow those points up. One point that was raised in the last evidence session was that there was something unusual about the, the, the wording, the Treasury may make a scheme. Would you agree that's unusual or is that normal language for statutes of this kind? Well, um, it's Parliamentary Council that does the uh, drafting of the statutes, you should appreciate, and it's not me. Uh, my understanding of that was that um, that was a necessary wording to empower Treasury to deliver on the requirements of Smith. And, and is it, in your view, the Treasury that's included in these clauses because the Treasury is the government department to which you are currently accountable? It is. Thanks very much. Um, Tamish. Thank you. Yeah, can I just ask about um, the, the matters that are, <coughs> excuse me, that are, that continue to be reserved, such as defence and, and um, oil and gas and so on and so forth. Uh, it's envisaged, uh, and certainly Smith envisaged this in the context of uh, government to government relationships, that there'll be some a memor memorandum of understanding. Have you been asked to give some thought to that as to what that might look like in the context of, of, of these uh, issues which will remain reserved to the United Kingdom government but are within Scottish waters? Thanks. Would you, I mean, you presumably have a deal of expertise dealing with them at the moment, or, or are, are involved, shall I say, in, in how those are being d well, dealt with at the moment? Well, we, we, would, in, we, would, we would inform the process if we were called upon by, by Treasury to do that, um, based on our, on our knowledge. But matters such as defence um, and uh, oil and gas um, are very much matters for the, the respective departments. 
It's the wrong way around. At the moment, you wouldn't necessarily be terribly involved in those issues. Would that be, would that be fair comment? Well, uh, in terms of, of the running of our business now, um, I, I think it's probably best if I ask um, sure. my colleague Ronnie yeah. to, to handle that. In, in relation to the MOU, um, at this point in time, no, we haven't been asked yeah. to okay. input. No, appreciate that. Yeah, there's not really much to add to that. I'm, I'm afraid we, we have interactions, obviously, with, with DEC, who, who retain oil and gas. Uh, rights for the UK and work with them where we can on uh, particularly offshore wind renewable projects and we also have uh, some liaison with the Minister of Defence in respect of the, the placement of, of, of some uh, resources. Uh, but uh, what, going back to your original point, I, I can't say I'm uh, terribly well cited in what the intention was here. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Stuart? Thank is it in this area too? Um, just uh, very briefly on this one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so just it's in terms of the, the, the transition, um, and uh, in terms of the offshore. I mean, have you had any any discussions with uh, the people in the aquaculture industry and also with the, with the, the marine tourism sector in terms of the uh, in terms of the changes and the proposals? Um, the, uh, we've got a small office and we have a, 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 an open plan office and most of what I hear at the moment is discussion with our team with customers and stakeholders looking for, for clarity and, and looking to understand what, what any change means for them. Um, so that might mean it's their home or their farm in a rural context or it might be in their business or their mooring or, their, or, or, or a lease. So there's a lot of discussion going on and, and it's really mixed. Um, some people have uh, direct concerns because of business decisions that we are taking today that have 25-year 20 year life impact, if you like, and we've got to make sure that we continue to make those uh, decisions properly. Um, others just want to know that the policy and the procedures will remain similar. Um, I think the area that um, was touched on earlier was one of um, clarity over different geographic areas. And that's a question that's being asked time and, uh, time and again about um, what will I get if I uh, do X in this area, but will it be different in another area? So I think there's, there's a lot of questions being asked. Um, and the, I mean, there was a discussion at the recent cross-party group, uh, Stuart, as you know, about uh, marine users talking about the advantages of, of looking at these assets uh, and the management of them and the interest strategically to make sure that we don't get aquaculture conflicting with marine leisure and we don't get navigation issues and, and, and local conflict and we all know about the, the sort of navigation issues that are working at the moment and, and you know when people look at the sea they quite often don't see how many uses are being used of a certain area and that's where a lot of the, the discussion is happening at the moment is clarity on what will happen in the future and clarity on, on making sure that um, we're still an attractive place to invest. I think Mr. Finch mentioned that for renewables. It's exactly the same in the aquaculture industry. The, the producer organisation has been very clear with us that you know, Scotland as a place to invest is competing with Norway or with Chile or you know, other areas to come and bring industry to Scotland. And they want clarity as to where that might be. The lot, uh, if I may, it can be it is, yeah. It's just, it's Mr. Laidlaw, a moment ago you mentioned, uh, you gave an example of uh, potentially entering into longer term contracts and then what would actually happen. Um, what actually would the Crown Estate need uh, in terms of uh, clarity? What, what would the Crown Estate need to ensure that, uh, that the services that they currently provide uh, to, uh, to these people involved in the, in the, at the other end of the contracts, uh, that, that, uh, that that actual contract is still going to be maintained and the service delivery is going to be there? I think the key point that we would cover there is we're, we've got a statutory function to fulfil at the moment of managing the assets as we are set up. And there's a discussion about devolution and we're open to that and, and you know, we look forward to making that happen and delivery beyond. So we've got to keep delivering at the moment. Um, there are many land use decisions and land management and asset management decisions that I take on a day-to-day -day basis that are absolutely 100% aligned with all of Scottish Government's policy about sustainable economic growth, involving local communities, added value and investment into local areas. So most of them actually, you know, as long as that continues and we know where we're going, the, cl the clarity on, you know, I don't want to make a decision tomorrow on a 25-year land use that somebody says to me, um, we have the chair of the Rural Affairs Committee here as well, could pull me up in three years' time and say, well, that was a silly thing to do. So that clarity would be really appreciated to know where the direction of travel is and to make sure we're still making correct asset management decisions.
I could just add to this from a layman's perspective. <clears throat> Excuse me, at our last and most recent Scottish Liaison Group meeting at Bellsbury, when we had about 23 stakeholders there, the representative from Scottish Marine Leisure Tourism spoke very passionately about the momentum that they have uh, gathered o over recent years. And that has been um, an aligned industry approach with a strategic policy for Scottish marine tourism. And I was absolutely flabbergasted when he said it was worth more to Scot Scotland PLC than golf was. And he, but he felt that, that the delivery of that strategy was not yet complete, and he was very concerned that uh, any fragmentation of that. So it has to be looked at a Scottish view for that. He said it's worth over £300 million to Scotland. Well, as you're aware, Mr Baird also said that the next uh, step in that particular strategy is launched this afternoon. Okay. Put that on the record. Well done, Stuart. Thank you very much. Uh, twice. Um, I think Linda had one specifically in that area, and then I'm going to yeah, Rob Gibson. Just sorry, a... Linda, let me finish you. Then, oh, I'm going, sorry. Then, then I'm going to Rob Gibson. Then I'm going to change slight direction here and move on to another area with Alison after you two for a couple of supplementaries. Yeah, it was just something that Alan had said following on from Vivian. Um, the Smith Commission report talked about responsibility for the management of the economic assets being transferred. And then, you know, the draft clauses are also talking about transfer of wholly owned Scottish property assets. And I just wondered if, you know, in the discussions that you've had with the UK government treasury, I guess, um, if you have reached an understanding of what that actually means, what does economic assets mean and entail? Um, well, the, um, the economic assets um, under Crown Estate management are those that are um, wholly owned. Um, they are um, assets that um, that, uh, that are, 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 are traded. So it's, it's it's very much part of our it's our wholly owned portfolio. portfolio. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, in the transition period, uh, which we hope can be uh, smooth and therefore that uh, decisions that you're making are ones that will stand and uh, one wouldn't want to see, uh, you know, people going into a situation where you're making decisions and then uh, somebody else thinking that they were wrong. Are you going to continue to invest during the transition period? Because this will be two or three years at least possibly before we get this sorted out. That off and then Ronnie with uh, absolutely. Um, Marie. Uh, I think the phrase business as usual, as usual was used earlier, and that's the, the way the, the team are looking at this at the moment. I say we've got a statutory function to keep managing these assets, and we've got a team that are really proud of what they do, they're really good at what they do, and they want to continue to see the good work that they have done for many years and in some cases uh, delivered. So they are really keen that that continues. So our normal investment programme of investing into our holdings, looking for new opportunities will continue. It's business as usual in a different context because we have to be aware of the discussions that we're having here with the committee today that Smith's set out and, and, and the process that we're going through. So um, we will still continue our, our normal investment programme in that way. Uh, and, and I know Ronnie would uh, like to update you, I'm sure, on, on his side of the business. Yes, thank you, Mr Gibson. First of all, I would fervently hope that we don't have a three-year transition period. I think um, specifically for the renewable industry, we, we really don't need or want uh, a prolonged transition period. The more certainty we, uh, we can get into these areas, the better. And I think you know, um, Mr Finch spoke about some of that this morning. Um, so far as energy and infrastructure, we are continuing and still investing uh, as, as we're going along. The Magen project that we entered into uh, till end of last year, we're making substantial payments in respect of that now and intend to do so for the rest of the year. So these investments are still running and still working uh, and we intend to do so. How uh, gross are these uh, investments from well, the business the, in the, Scotland? The, the Magen investment is um, £10 million. So there are other investments, obviously, gross in terms of offshore as well. There are, yes. Which amount to? Uh, well, uh, I think if, if we can refer to the, um, the latest uh, annual report that we've, we've sent out, I think over the last uh, four years, we've invested just over £33 million uh, 
um, in Scottish assets, and, uh, much of that is in the, the renewable side. So this is quite a big uh, input to the, the Scottish case with the skills that you bring with this in terms of uh, the way that you focus your investment to, t to help them deliver. Um, you talked about offshore renewables, uh, you know, uh, uh, in particular. Is the expertise in Scotland or is it shared with uh, uh, other offices in London? Or what? Tell me what would happen in the transition to uh, your... Uh, approach to helping people develop in Scotland? Are we going to have the skills transferred? What I, what I can say is that it is, as you say, very much seen and the estate is managed uh, on a UK-wide basis just now. So I have some UK responsibilities. Other people who work out of Bellsbury uh, have some UK responsibilities. Equally, people in uh, the, the London office uh, do some advisory work on some of the Scottish projects. So it's not uh, wholly clear, clear cut. Uh, I can advise that there are uh, 12 people uh, working out of Bellsbury who work in the energy and infrastructure portfolio, but there are many more uh, who work uh, south of the border advising into uh, the Scottish projects, and likewise people in Bellsbury who advise into UK projects. So that has to be unscrambled if we're going to have the management of the assets and so on in Scotland. And it's um, one of the issues that um, I think the, the transfer scheme would hope to address. Thank you. Um, I think, Alison, you wanted to... Yes, um, thank you. As we were discussing with the earlier panel, there will still be scope for the Crown Estate to invest in Scotland. Just wondered why that provision was included and how you think what, what that investment might look like. Um, in particular, you know, an example might be that the management of rural estates might be transferred to Scottish ministers one day, and then the next day the Crown Estate Commissioner could go out and invest perhaps in some other rural estates in Scotland. It seems to me that we have a devolution of of what the Crown Estate is on a certain date, and then potentially you could be building another Crown Estate portfolio in Scotland, which would also have to be managed. So I, I'd just like to uh, yeah. uh, hear if your I views may, on that. Um, we are absolutely clear about this devolution process, and we will do everything we can to accelerate that and make sure that um, and provide information so that the, the outcome is best for Scotland. I think the question I might put back to you at the moment, um, pre-devolution, the Crown Estate is a £10 billion uh, asset organisation. And I think, as Vivian said, our benchmarks out there uh, in industry are recognised uh, as being uh, very, uh, uh, either at the top or very near the top. I'm not speaking as a Crown Estate Commissioner here now, I'm speaking as a Scot. Why would we not in Scotland want a very big, successfully managed business investing in our country? But you it's a business. It's, uh, if you take away the, the uh, I fully realise all the emotion uh, surrounding the Crown Estate and all the rest of it. But uh, that, that response seems to suggest then that the Scottish ministers will you know, have the responsibility for managing anything that is devolved at at a certain date, but the Crown Estate Commissioner can then continue to build up a large portfolio in Scotland. I, think what it, it, I don't think it would be in anyone's think, thoughts, because none of the assets of the, the seabed or the coastal areas would be involved. I suspect it's probably in areas of business investment into sectors that were involved in elsewhere ports and harbours, energy uh, 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 and others. And so there may be schemes, uh, and we're discussing schemes with our tenants at the moment, that they're looking for capital investment in that is, is alongside our ownership of the foreshore seabed, but also is as a, is a, as a partner potentially to help unlock uh, economic activity in key sectors to Scotland. So I think uh, I wasn't involved you know, at all in, in, those, uh, in the drafting of those clauses, but I suspect it's there to allow... So if a, a large harbour was doing an expansion and, and wanted £30 million investment, that that may be open to the Crown Estate body corporate from, from the south in the future. But I, I don't think it's ever been intended that there would be uh, any replication, and, and certainly that's not been the thinking of our team locally. Okay. Um, can I ask what are your current investment levels in Scotland and 
you know, are they on an upward trajectory? Is there a trend there? Yeah, I mean, um, there is an upward trajectory. Um, the last published annual accounts had the, the capital value at about 267. That was up about £30 million from the previous year, uh, driven largely by the increase in valuation, capital valuation, I have to say, of um, some offshore renewable schemes that had received consent by that stage. So the, there is a, an upward trajectory at, at this point in time. Do you have any planned disposals of assets between now and transfer? And, and if you did, would you have to seek permission from Scottish ministers to dispose of those assets? To have any planned uh, disposals. Okay, thank you. And, and one final question. Um, this is a, it's an onshore interest that is, is in the region. Yeah. I want to con for, can I, I just want to get this clear, clear this up. So I'm absolutely clear in my mind what's been talked about in the area. You quite rightly um, went into there. If the Crown Estate were to make future investments in Scotland um, uh, after devolution, will the receipts, etc., that flow from that come to the devolved government or will they continue to be reserved? They will continue to be reserved. Okay. Linda? Can, can, can I just say, uh, I, I would like more clarity in this as well because um, I don't know if Tavish will agree with me, but this is something brand new to me. Um, compared to all the discussions we had at the Smith Commission, can I have it very clear that what you're saying is that in your understanding as at the commercial enterprise that, that you have talked about yourself as at the moment, is that there will be a transfer of what you currently have at the given date following the scheme or whatever, and from that point on, you are free to start all over again building up a portfolio in Scotland? Well, the, um, the investments that the Crown State make, make are um, uh, uh, assessed um, um, as, they, as those opportunities arise, and they're made in accordance with our investment strategy. Um, as, as I've mentioned, we are a major investor in, in property in the UK, and we'd like to think that with government support, we could um, continue to be able to um, invest uh, UK-wide with the um, advantages that that brings in terms of employment and skills um, and so on. So, um, so that's, that's uh, what sits behind. So, so what you're saying is that you have agreed with the UK government that following the transfer of what you currently have, the devolution stops there and you carry on as a commercial enterprise potentially in Scotland. Potentially, yes. The, the command paper um, makes reference for it being possible for the Crown Estate to make um, investments um, in Scotland um, after the transfer, and they will remain a reserve matter. Right. Can I please have it put on record, convener, that that is absolutely opposed to any understanding at all I had when I sat on the Smith Commission? You don't on record. I think it's something that's a, a bit of a surprise to us, but um, um, we, we know we are. Lewis. For, 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 for clarity on, on that point, can I ask two questions? First of all, uh, do the Crown Estate Commissioners currently invest out with the United Kingdom or is investment confined to the UK? Investment's confined to the UK. So, therefore, you would be looking, in a sense, to maintain the ability to invest across the UK from Crown Estate Commissioners uh, subsidiary to the Treasury. Would it be part of the same or would, it be, would there be a logic to the same arrangement that the devolved Crown Estates, as they would be in Scotland, um, would be in a position to invest in England, Wales and Northern Ireland if they chose, if the Crown Estates or the successor bodies of the Crown Estates in Scotland chose to develop a commercial investment portfolio? I think I can, I can only speak for the um, powers and duties of the Crown Estate under the... Crown Estate Act um, and not for uh, whatever purpose Scottish Government might seek to put the uh, management powers that were transferred. But, but in, in principle, if, if, if Crown Estates, the current body, is able to invest commercially in property anywhere in the United Kingdom and that continued to attach to the Crown Estate Commissioners incorporated uh, under the Treasury, in principle, uh, a similar power could readily be available to any devolved successor body. I, th I, think, I think that would be a matter of uh, policy for, for government. Okay, just before, Alison, just let me one, one more bit of clarity. I'm grateful for the clarity you've already provided. Uh, was there, is there any consideration that if a following a 
after devolution following an investment that a share of that investment should come to Scotland and a share of it should go to the but still to remain at the Treasury or is all of the, 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 the income that might be derived from that activity envisaged to end up continuing to be reserved in the Treasury? The, the Crown Estate would, re, would remain a, um, a reserve matter. Okay. Um, so. okay, that's fine. I understand that entirely, Vivian. Just, I just want to be totally clear. So we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we, in effect, have two Crown Estates, one operating in Scotland and one administered by the Crown Estate Commissioner in London. Well, the Crown Estate, um, um, uh, under, the, under, under the Crown Estate Act, would continue to, um, would continue to exist. Um, what happens to the management powers that are transferred to Scotland after devolution will be a matter for, um, for Scottish Government. Okay, thank you. Um. Alex, I don't know if you want to ask a question on cohesion at this stage, or, do you, or would you rather reserve it to later? <laughs> I, th I think I could reserve it to later, but I have a very small point on the same subject. Okay. Okay. Uh, just to develop this further from my understanding, uh, we've talked around the whole issue of investments. Uh, when the, the devolution process takes place, money which has been invested by the Crown Estate uh, in projects in Scotland uh, on the basis that it would generate a return, the, the Revenue generated by these projects would become the uh, property of the Scottish uh, Government or a local authority, depending on the schemes that take place. So where do these investments fit within this structure? Do you require um, to uh, get your return on that capital before any revenue is redistributed? Or do you require the body which is taking over the management of that asset to recompense you for the investment that has been made? Oh, this is exactly the sort of complex level of detail that will need to be uh, talked through as part of um, working up the statutory transfer scheme. The whole process of apportioning um, will, will, will require um, a lot of detailed thought with um, the finance team on, uh, on, on the Crown Estate and also um, in, in Scottish Government. But you, you have touched on one of the areas of complexity that um, sits with, with transfer of our management. Am I, am I right in thinking, however, that in general terms there is no prospect of the Crown Estate retaining debt for which it no longer has the right to accrue any uh, return? The, the, Crown, the Crown Estate um, won't continue to have any involvement in relation to the um, management that's devolved after the point. The revenue, you need your investment back. Um, no, I did. I, Alan. Um, if I can bring it down to a small level, um, if we invest tomorrow in a new building on a tenanted unit and we say it's £100,000, the tenant brings £100,000, we operate in partnership and there's a, an amendment to the rent of £1,000 for argument, that £1,000 will stay within whatever body is set up with the Crown Estate in Scotland. There would be no expectation of any apportionment of funds or anything like that. So investments that we made five years ago, their revenue flows through our annual accounts and the, net, the figure is 13.6 at the bottom uh, there. If that's 13.6 plus the thousand pounds for the investment I make next week, that we envisage will all flow into whatever body is created by Parliament in, in Scotland. Uh, there's, there's not a, any expectation that there would be a uh, any sort of averaging or, or anything like that. So, you know, we, we, we is, try and simplify it convener uh, slightly. I don't know if that's helped or not. It, it, it just brings me to, bring, uh, well, I can understand the simplification, but it does raise another question in my mind. And then I'll come to Alison, because I know you've still got a question. You, you, you now have the potential, if a project was to develop on a harbour in Scotland, that the Crown Estate UK and the Crown Estate Scotland could both invest in that project. It's highly unlikely. Um, and, and I can't, and having been involved in, in those decisions in, in the last week, well, I couldn't ever envisage that happening at the moment. Well, well, well. Alison. Um, thank you, convener. I'd just like to um, understand why a particular property, Fort Canaird, um, which is in the region I represent, has not been included in the proposed transfer. And I'd also like to understand, um, does it generate a significant income scheme you know how, how much revenue do we receive from it well do, does the crown estate receive 
Um, I think it was mentioned uh, with the earlier panel that um, there are likely to be legal reasons uh, around this. Um, and uh, Fort, Fort Kinnaird is, is held in a, in a separate structure. Um, it's not actually a Scottish asset in the Crown Estate's Scottish portfolio. Um, our interest in uh, Fort Kinnaird is a partnership interest um, held in a mixed property English limited partnership along with another property in Cheltenham. Uh, we don't um, have a direct interest in it. Um, we don't... Uh, we don't manage that property. Um, we have never included that property in our financial statement for Scotland contained in our, in our Scotland report. So as a result of that, um, it's, uh, it's not a, an economic asset in Scotland as envisaged by, by Smith. So this massive shopping mall on the outskirts of Edinburgh, it, it, it's not benefiting Scotland economically? Well, it's... Uh, our interest in it um, is not an economic interest in Scotland. Okay. Um, and do you, so you, do you have no idea at all about the revenue that it generates? Um, I believe that the um, revenue was um, in the region of four million um, net. Um, but I'd, if 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 uh, if I could, I'd like to provide some um, absolute clarity on that after. Okay. After this, uh, that would be hearing. appreciated. Thank you. Thank uh, you, convener. Yeah, thank you, convener. Can I just, um, dare I say it, prolong this bit about the second Crown Estate? Uh, I'm just trying to get this absolutely crystal clear in my mind. Um, at some point, the assets, as uh, Linda Fabiano was saying earlier on, will transfer um, to uh, the Scottish Government and to the Scottish Parliament. Um, at, but what is envisaged in terms of what we've learned this morning is that there will be a, a UK investment body, um, which will be called something but presumably will be the continuing Crown Estate based in London, which can take investment decisions across the United Kingdom, including in Scotland, and it could invest in whatever portfolio areas you... Sorry, the, the, that body wishes to invest in. Would that be fair? Yes, 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 yes it, it, uh, it, it would. So, as, as, as we've said, um, we, we, we would hope that uh, our, our investment in Scotland would be as welcome as any other... Sure. Um, um, yeah. responsible investor. And, and, and when the Treasury were consulting you, as you very fairly described right at the start of your evidence this morning, um, was this something that they introduced or was this something that you suggested to them was a sensible way in which you can continue to do business across the United Kingdom? Well, it, it, was, it was in the mix, really, um, because we talked about the fact that um, Scotland will remain part of the, the UK, the Crown Estate, yeah. and is empowered to invest in, in the UK. So what does that mean? But when you say in the mix, did, uh, was it, your, it was the Crown Estate's suggestion that you wish to continue to be able to invest. I don't mean you personally, but I, do, do, don't, I mean the body, the corporate body, could, would be able to continue to invest across the United Kingdom. Yeah, the, yes, the Crown Estate would wish to be able to um, um, invest um, in, yeah. the, in, the, in the UK. But, you know, our, our role was very much an informing role. And um, as, as, no, I've, as I've explained, yeah. okay. the, the process was led by Treasury. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. That was quite helpful, helpful actually, Tavish. And I just, as an aside to Lewis, I just said, yes, it would be great to do that and understand why that should continue. But it would not also be appropriate that Scotland gets a share of the action. That's the point, I think, in terms of where I am, in terms of the revenue stream that would come in future. But that's an issue we obviously need to take up with Treasury officials or, or the Secretary of State. I realise it's not for you. But, sorry, um, Mark. Yeah, I'm very interested by the response to Alison Johnson's question, and I want to explore that a little bit further. Um, Mr Laidlaw used a phrase around something not being likely as a scenario, which is not the same as something not being possible as a scenario. So I want to explore a possible scenario off the back of what Alison Johnson has said. So in the intervening period between the command paper and the eventual devolution, is there anything that would prevent the Crown Estate from entering into future investments in Scotland around the model that Alison Johnson has, uh, that you've responded to Alison Johnson with in relation to Fort Kinnaird, where these are assets which are physically located in Scotland, but as a result of the accounting measures or, or the legal uh, agreements that you've entered into, are not defined by the Crown Estate as assets in Scotland. That is to say that following the devolution of the Crown Estate, there could be a scenario where future investments that have been made in Scotland would not be devolved under that arrangement in the same way that would happen with Fort Kinnaird. 
Well, the Crown Estate's responsibilities under the Crown Estate Act um, will, will continue, and we will continue to discharge those up to um, the point of devolution. Um, our investment strategy um, um, requires investments to be um, assessed as the opportunities arise, and investments are made in accordance with, with that strategy, and that's the way we, we deliver our Crown Estate Act duties. But there is nothing that would prevent the Crown Estate from, say, taking a bundle of investments which cross both England and Scotland, but uh, capturing those within an agreement that exists in England, as is the case with Fort Canaird, so that all of those would not show on the books of the Crown Estate as a Scottish asset, in the same way that is being dis described with Fort Canaird, and therefore those would not fall under the terms of the clauses, in terms of what would be devolved. That scenario could play out. Uh, over the intervening period in terms of any future investments that are made prior to devolution. Would that be, that, that be accurate? Mr MacDonald, I, I suppose to the letter of the word uh, it would be accurate. I can assure you there is absolutely no intention to muddy the waters at all uh, in this process leading up to devolution of the Crown Estates in Scotland. Absolutely none. But, but, but you'll forgive me, that is already in existence with Fort Canaird, so there is already that the precedent there that that has happened uh, with what from uh, I'm not familiar with Fort Canaird but those who who are tell me it's quite a lucrative uh, investment or, or ought to be quite a lucrative investment so you will forgive me for the fact that the precedent is there and the possibility is there that we have to then as a committee take that very seriously in terms of our considerations for the implication of that for for the devolution of the crown estate I, I accept that. Uh, we're just um, drafting our, or completing, should I say, our business plan for next financial year, and there's nothing that looks like what you're suggesting may happen in the business plan on, on either Ronnie or I sectors. And uh, we shared our business plan with Scottish Government uh, uh, colleagues uh, last year, and we've agreed to do the same this year. Um, and you know, I, I, I hear exactly what you say in terms of the potential, um, but uh, you know. As, as much as I am able to say in my part of the business, there are no plans for that sort of structure. And indeed, all the preparations that we are doing that, that uh, Vivian mentioned in terms of discussions with the Scottish Government are assuming that all of our assets will transfer as a package, as one, into whatever vehicle or, or body is identified. And I think in terms of that, that, that's all I can say at the moment. As, as manager of the, those portfolio assets at the moment, there's, there's no such intention to clarify to muddy any water just want to deliver the assets that we look after today uh, and, and I think Ronnie's nodding at the same time into the new body as they are at the moment and mm -hmm. and I think that's as, as far as we are able as as members of the team to, to clarify that is there is it well just one one, one very sorry, very and, final and, sorry, and, sorry Mark in the time I've got left what I'm going to ask though is I'm, we're going to write to you because I think we need some clarity around the fork one of the things that's come clear around this um, table from all of our colleagues is the fact that we need as much transparency as we can possibly achieve as the powers are transferred to the Scottish Parliament. We are the body responsible to making sure that we scrutinise all this properly. So I think we will write to you to ask you some further questions about Fort Kinnaird and the arrangements about how the, the funding and mechanisms will work in the future, just so we have got more than we have got on here on the record, so that it is in, in a written format and there can be no misunderstandings. I think that would be fair to everybody to do that. Um, and at that basis, I'm going to Lewis on energy. Thank you very much. Um, on, on energy matters, can I first of all ask, am, am I right to assume that uh, there are no unintended consequences in any of this for the oil and gas industry, um, that the scheme can be designed to avoid any unintended consequences? I'm thinking particularly in relation to pipelines um, and other access uh, within uh, Crown Estate. Uh, uh, responsibilities for the foreshore and so on. Um, and in, a, in relation to that as well, there is a project, as you know, based at Peterhead Power Station for transferring what are currently pipelines for extracting oil and gas into pipelines for depositing and storing carbon offshore. That's a very exciting project. Um, how will this um, propose, how will the process we're describing here uh, uh, impact upon? that change of use uh, offshore. Thank you. Uh, just to follow on uh, and to be consistent with uh, what's been said before, I believe that uh, what we're trying to do 
is to transfer everything currently managed by the Crown Estate in Scotland across to Scottish ministers. And that would include the renewable energy assets. It includes the control over the cables and pipelines within 12 nautical miles. And it goes back up, uh, partly to what Mr Scott uh, was, was saying earlier on about the interaction between oil and gas uh, and, and renewable energy and the, the work that we do in respect of crossing agreements, etc., with, with cables and pipelines and managing that interflow into, or, or rather, onshore. Um, you've picked up a, a good point with respect to carbon capture and storage, and in particular the GoldenEye field, which I think is the one, one you're referring to, uh, and that is also intended to transfer, and you're right, the, the, the use of the pipeline and the, the, um, the site itself is also part and is intended to be part of the, the transfer scheme. Um, you know, I, I'm quite clear on that. So that transfer, at the, as it's envisaged at the moment, would be to the Scottish Government. Uh, would there be any implications from further devolution from the Scottish to the local authority level um, for projects of that kind, uh, and indeed for offshore renewable projects which are located between local authority uh, areas such as the Murray Firth? Well, uh, I think um, Mr. Mr Finch uh, this morning alluded to um, his view of, of some of the, the difficulties and issues that, that would arise. Therefore, um, I would say that I have heard similar um, concerns being expressed to me by members of, of particularly the renewables, the renewables industry. Uh, I think carbon capture and storage uh, is well beyond 12 nautical miles. Uh, how, how that would be dealt with, um, it would need to be considered quite carefully. It is of a very strategic nature. It has huge implications for not just for Scotland, but for the UK and for the world, because this is, this is a world leading project. Uh, and I'm very keen that we don't put anything in the way that's going to make that more difficult to deliver what is already a very um, substantial project. Thanks very much. And going beyond the 12-mile limit into the uh, exclusive economic zone, Scottish territorial zone, um, the clauses refer to rights in relation to the Scottish zone. And I confirm that that is, uh, as we describe, it's the UK continental shelf up to 200 miles nautical miles from the shore and as defined by the Scottish Adjacent Waters Boundary the Order of 1999. I'll bow to your um, legislative More, more a question than that. <laughs> it, it, it applies to the sea that is covered by devolved powers currently. Is that yes, right? I mean, I, I'm under no doubt that um, all the renewable energy projects that we manage both within 12 nautical miles and out with 12 nautical miles out uh, within the renewable energy zone, out to 200 nautical miles, are included. I, and um, that, that's my clear understanding in the matter. And covered by the wording of the clauses. Indeed. Stands. Thank you very much. I just want to end by going back to the beginning. Oh, sorry, on you go. Just a wee process. One, in terms of uh, engagement with UK ministers and officials and the reference to um, Scottish government ministers and officials, uh, um, can we have an in indication of um, the scale, scope of those meetings? Are there any minutes, uh, agendas that are publicly available for, for, for the committee in terms of these, the, 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 these engagements? Um, well, um, we've, we've met with, um, with, with Treasury um, on, an, on a number of occasions to talk about the, um, the process of... Um, devolution. We, we, I'm afraid we don't have any minutes, but the sort of things that we cover um, have included largely information about our, our business, um, uh, as, I, as I mentioned previously, definitions of, that might be helpful. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I'm probably it's fair to say that a lot of the questions have come from our side about how the process will run. Um, so we've been very much um, in, a, in, an, in an informing mode um, for our meetings with, um, with, with Treasury. Um, I've met with uh, um, officials at Scotland office very much to talk about how we're managing the process now to get the business ready for devolution. Um, and that's been very much the focus of discussions with uh, Scottish government officials. Um, so uh, we've, we've had 
Uh, well, I've, I've certainly had one, and there have been a number of meetings with uh, Scottish Government officials, um, but there's certainly, certainly been some very focused meetings on the process of preparing for transfer. Um, we, on Friday, supplied um, Scottish Government officials with a number of documents that um, we feel will help us work together to this uh, common end. And we have a project meeting set up for next Friday, um, which will include the uh, entirety of, uh, of, of the um, specialists um, from the Crown Estate with the specialists um, from Scottish Government who are assigned to, to managing this process. It's pretty much an all-day um, event. But I know that uh, colleagues of mine have had um, other um, discussions about this and might like to contribute to to that. Has there been any ministerial engagement at the UK or the Scottish Government levels yet? It's all been by officials. I, I, I haven't had um, involvement with, uh, with, with ministers, no. I don't know if colleagues have. We've been discussing it at exact level and I'm not certain um, if I've missed that there is a minister assigned to, to this transfer at the moment because there are different uh, parts of the business involved in different ministerial uh, portfolios and I think uh, as Vivian has said the initial discussions are very much on understanding what this means as a transfer um, I mean the, the meeting that Vivian talked about a few days after Smith was arranged was, was with people who we've dealt with for many years and understand what we do but maybe needed to understand how we do it and what that means as part of a transfer to as try and get as seamless a transfer as possible. So uh, that's the sort of discussions that, that we're having. Well, you have a paper that you'll be presented with a number of challenges. Uh, we are presenting. You can't, you can't share that with the committee or the public at this stage. I think, I think we've, we've put a paper to the Scottish Government about the sort of things that we think need to be covered. Uh, and, and I don't see, uh, you know, unless there's any problems anywhere else, any issue with sharing that with the committee. But that's been something that we've drafted and taken that's forward. That's helpful. So, as, just, okay, as a, as a conclusion, I want to go back to the beginning. And sorry, I'm back at section 23 again. Because the first paragraph, or the first section of the Scotland Act said, there shall be a Scottish Parliament. There shall be a Scottish Parliament. And Donald Dewar, I think we all like that. Um, so if it's good for the, to create a Scottish Parliament, why is it not good to create the, a, a Crown Estate in Scotland that says the Treasury should... Sh may make a scheme. Why can't it be the Treasury shall make a scheme? No, transfer, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying shall make a scheme, not rather than there shall be a Scottish. Why can't it be that terminology? Well, I, I, I think that would be a question that um, I would want to direct to Parliamentary Council. Um, I wasn't involved in the um, wording here, so it's, um, it's my understanding it's, uh, it's, it's empowering Treasury, but it's, it's very much the the draftman's uh, territory. Yeah. Would the Crown Estate have any objection to the word shall? I, I, w I wouldn't like to pass a comment in um, a sector that's beyond my territory. It's very okay. much Parliamentary <laughs> Council's territory. Okay. I'll ask the I'll ask Michael that when he comes before us then. <laughs> I'm not going to let that one go, I'm afraid. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming and giving evidence. It's been quite illuminating. Gareth, is something somebody you want to end with? Um, I understand uh, the concerns uh, of, of your committee around the legislation. Um, I must stress here, as, as the Crown of State, we are doing everything that we can to inform uh, Scottish ministers and the UK government about our activity and, um, and what needs to be done, what activity needs to be taken on to, to maintain the good work that this team's done in Scotland. And, uh, there's one thing that m maybe we haven't covered today but because of the discussion around the legislation, but really it's the people. And I just wanted to make a wee point here. Um, we are doing everything 100% to get this process do through quickly, clearly, and very openly um, for our stakeholders. Uh, this is a time of real uncertainty and huge concern. And in those stakeholders, I would can, uh, talk about um, we've talked about the aquaculture industry. Uh, we've got communities out there with whom we've gone into local management agreements who have taken real ownership of economic activity in their area. They, they are concerned about the uncertainty. Uh, from my own perspective, uh, I'm a tenant farmer down in Kelso. Our, t 
um, our agricultural tenants are very concerned uh, about how it goes forward. And these, these businesses are multi-generational businesses, and we're talking about not just their businesses, but their homes. And that takes as real concern for them. And finally, the last word I would say that our own team down at Bellsbury, it's a time for enormous uncertainty for them. They're obviously concerned. And my uh, absolute uh, determination in that is to get that team who have enormous intellectual capacity and resource and experience passed across the Scottish ministers for the benefit of Scotland. Okay, no, sorry, we're going to have to conclude now because I need to move on. But can I just say, on behalf of the committee, we share these same concerns. Absolutely no doubt about that. And, but and we very much value you coming along today and sharing what you, the evidence you can. And we obviously realise at the end of the day, it's politicians that will make the decisions. Uh, but you've helped us uh, you know, show, th throw some light in some important areas. So I'm very grateful for you coming to evidence that we now move into private session. Thank you very much.